the Colosseum in Rome, a giant sports arena built almost 2,000 years ago. The Roman society that created this imposing structure has left many others, from an amphitheater in the Middle East to an emperor's palace in Yugoslavia, from an aqueduct in France to a public bath in England. Impressive Roman structures are scattered across three continents. They are evidence of the greatest empire in the ancient world. At its height, the empire included about 75 million people living on these lands around the Mediterranean. Capital of the empire was Rome, and the history of the empire begins in that city. Legend has it that Rome was founded on the Tiber River in 753 BC by Romulus, one of twin brothers. The archaeological evidence indicates that tribes from Central Europe may have crossed the Alps about 3,000 years ago and settled in Italy. A people called the Latins established themselves in the area where the city of Rome later developed. Hard-working farmers built a Latin economy based on agriculture. The Latins were conquered by a people called the Etruscans, who took this part of Italy. The settlement on the Tiber River was taken by Etruscan kings, who ruled the Latin people, and organized the city-state of Rome. Most of the Roman people were farmers, who belonged to the plebeian class. Persons of high rank, the nobles, belonged to the patrician class. In 509 BC, the Romans overthrew their Etruscan king, and the patricians set up the Roman Republic. The main legislative body was the Senate. Two consuls were the chief executive officers, all elected from the patrician class. Written laws, along with two tribunes, safeguarded the rights of the plebeian class. In this society, the basic social unit was the Roman family headed by the father. The highly prized title of Roman citizen granted a man the right to vote and to hold office in Rome. Roman citizenship later spread through the Mediterranean world. Aristides, a professor in Asia Minor, describes it. Your magnificent citizenship with its grand conception. There is nothing like it in the records of all mankind. Equally important was Roman law a remarkable code of justice that Roman magistrates administered. Roman ideas of citizenship, law, and government were spread as the Roman Republic expanded. Behind this expansion was a powerful Roman army. A Roman writer describing the military system says, He who desires peace should prepare for war. Good training and capable leaders built a superb military organization. The standards of Rome were carried farther and farther by the armies of the Republic. By conquest and annexation, these lands around the Mediterranean were taken by 133 BC. Romans pushed westward into Spain and across the Mediterranean into the hot lands of North Africa. They marched eastward into historic Greece and on into the ancient countries of the Middle East. And finally across the Alps into Teutonic lands. Roman achievements are extolled by the poet Virgil. You, man of Rome, remember that you shall be to rule nations to make peace and crown it with law, to spare the humbled, and to crush the proud. 
the Romans brought their lifestyle into the conquered cities. The wealthy built beautiful villas in the countryside. The statesman and philosopher Seneca writes, Wherever the Roman conquers, there he dwells. And wherever they lived, Romans enriched their lives with the cultures they absorbed from conquered peoples. A Roman leader speaks of this heritage. Our ancestors, gentlemen, were good at imitating whatever was worthwhile in the culture of other nations. In fact, they eagerly imitated any promising idea, whether it came from friend or enemy. Roman intellectuals were fascinated by other cultures. Education for the elite included the study of the Greek language, science, philosophy, and fine arts. But the qualities of the Roman character that Roman thinkers admired most, soberness and dignity, integrity and moral strength, these were giving way in the second century BC to luxurious living and greed. Wealthy nobles were buying up large tracts of conquered lands and using captured people as slaves to farm their big estates. Small farmers with only four or five acres couldn't compete with the big landowners. They gave up the struggle and drifted into Rome in search of jobs. But there would be no work in the city. The unemployed joined others who were depending on the government for their food. By 100 BC, society was becoming divided between rich and poor. Reformers tried to reorganize the government, but failed. Civil war broke out in 88 BC, and again in 49 BC, this time lasting almost 20 years. During this strife, Julius Caesar emerged as Rome's dictator in 49 BC. A Roman poet describes him. He possessed not merely a reputation as a soldier, but was fierce and untamable in pursuit of his expectations. When Caesar was elected dictator perpetuus, dictator for life, the orator Cicero said, We have lost the reality of a republic. Fearing that he would make himself king, a group of senators assassinated Caesar in 44 BC. Caesar's heir was his grandnephew Octavian. Under his absolute rule, the Roman Republic became the Roman Empire. In 27 BC, the Senate gave him the title of Augustus, meaning the majestic. Augustus said his purpose was to be the author of the best possible government. As the first Roman emperor, he ruled a Roman world that reached from Rome and embraced most of Europe, as well as lands in Asia and North Africa. Augustus also rebuilt much of the city of Rome. He found Rome brick and left it marble. So said a Roman historian. Now the empire entered a period of 200 years of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. A Roman writer of the second century talks of it. The age old curse of war has been put aside. The whole world keeps holiday. During the two centuries of the Pax Romana, about 75 million people could travel and trade in complete safety on a system of Roman roads that tied the vast empire together. Roman roads reached the most remote military outposts. A Greek historian describes the borders. The frontiers of the Roman Empire were everywhere studded with cities and forts and towers. And the whole army was stationed along them. So it was impossible for the barbarians to break through. Protected by the military fortifications, civilian Romans were living well. Roman women were never confined to the house, as were the women of ancient Greece. They went about in public and were treated as equal partners in marriage. In 
In the public baths, Roman men liked to discuss politics, business, and problems of everyday life. Their thinking was influenced not only by the intellectuals and philosophers of ancient Greece, but also by religious ideas from Egypt, such as the ancient cult of Isis and Osiris. And from the Roman province of Palestine came a new influence, Christianity. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote, This name, Christians, comes from Christus, whom Pontius Pilate condemned to death. But the abominable superstition which had been suppressed for a while became widespread once more. In the first century AD, the infamous Emperor Nero began the persecution of the Christians. Later in the Colosseum, Romans watched Christians being put to death for their refusal to recognize their emperor as divine. But Christian missionaries gained more converts. The new religion became a growing problem for the Roman state. Pliny the Younger, a Roman official, writes to the emperor Trajan to report on how he deals with the problem. This religious mania has spread through the villages and the countryside as well. This is how I have dealt with people who were brought to me for being Christians. I ask if they are Christians. If they admit it, I warn them what the punishment is. If they persist, I order them executed. Trajan, one of the strongest of the Roman emperors, replies to Pliny. Certainly the Christians must not be hunted down. But if they are found guilty, then they must be punished, with this exception. If anyone denies he is a Christian and makes this clear by praying to Roman gods, he must be pardoned. But other changes, too, were occurring in Roman religion. In the Roman army, the old imperial way of life was being changed by influences from the east. The worship of the Persian sun god Mithras was spreading. And yet, vigorous emperors like Hadrian worked hard to preserve the empire. The grandeur that was Rome can still be seen in the imposing mausoleum he built for himself in Rome. Hadrian made it his policy to improve the army and to maintain the imperial frontiers. As his successor, Hadrian named Antoninus Pius, one of the best loved of Roman rulers. Difficulties increased for the next emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Much of his reign was spent in repressing attacks on the borders of the empire. Between battles, he set down many of his ideas in a philosophic work called Meditations. He wrote, A man should be upright and not be kept upright. He had also written, The universe is change. And changes came fast after Marcus Aurelius. By the third century AD, the army was no longer loyal to Rome, but only to its own commanders. Emperors won the throne by buying the allegiance of the army. Words of the second century historian Tacitus anticipate these times. The Romans are the only men on earth who attack poor and rich with the same enthusiasm. Robbery, murder are all disguised under the name Empire. The disastrous events of the third century mark the beginning of the decline, a terrible epidemic. A declining supply of wheat and invasions by barbarians. A Roman historian describes the breakdown. Our history now plunges from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and rust. Near the end of this tragic century, Diocletian became emperor. Of him, Eutropius, a Roman historian, says, Diocletian was a shrewd character, gifted with a penetrating intelligence. Diocletian tried to stop the decline by reorganizing the government. He divided the empire into two parts west and east. In Byzantium, he ruled the east. He appointed a co-emperor to rule the west. One result was a great increase in government officials. A huge top-heavy bureaucracy was created. A heavier burden of taxes was levied. 
By imperial decree, Diocletian tried to stabilize the economy. A kind of totalitarian state was developing. Tradesmen were bound to their jobs. Tenant farmers were bound to the land. Wages and prices were controlled. The prices of 800 different items were set from the cost of a chicken to the price of a piece of cloth. But all his regulations could not stop the soaring inflation that helped destroy the Roman economy. Constantine, another of the strong emperors, tried to stop the decline. He had won the throne in a crucial battle that his biographer Eusebius describes. When the day was already declining, the emperor had seen with his own eyes, so he said, the victorious emblem of the cross formed out of light, and near it the words, through this you will conquer. Believing he had won through the help of Christ, the victorious Constantine ended the persecution of the Christians. In 330 AD, aware that Rome itself was still predominantly pagan, Constantine moved the capital of the empire from Rome to Byzantium and renamed the city after himself, Constantinople. Constantinople became the Christian Rome, the Rome of the East. A century later, after repeated Teutonic invasions, the Western Empire at last fell. The date was 476. But Rome's gifts, engineering, architecture, government, law, these things did not die. In Constantinople, which became the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Roman traditions continued. The imperial court of the Emperor Justinian was evidence of Roman power in the East. Justinian codified the entire system of Roman law. It included concepts of justice and individual rights we recognize today. No one is compelled to defend a cause against his will. No one may be forcibly removed from his own house. No one suffers a penalty for what he thinks. In inflicting penalties, the age and inexperience of the guilty party must be taken into account. Almost two centuries after Justinian, the Germanic king Charlemagne reunited most of Western Europe and dreamed of restoring the Roman Empire in the West. In the year 800, he went to Rome where the Pope crowned him Charles Augustus, great and peaceful Roman Emperor. The successors of Charlemagne created the Holy Roman Empire in the West, which lasted until the 18th century. In the East, Constantinople remained the capital of the empire for a thousand years. Its fortifications held off attacks by the Ottoman Turks. But finally, a Turkish army stormed the walls of the city. Constantinople was captured in 1453. It was the end of the story that had begun 2,000 years before in the city of Rome. Perhaps these lines by a Roman poet sum it up. O oh Rome, bright star of stars in heaven above, you made a city out of all the world.